thrilled to be here with both of you. Fran, you know, you and I have been tethered to the hip since 2016. <laughs> I've missed you so very much. And Chuck, you have been such a remarkable contributor to the collective wisdom at Fortune through um, just showing up the CEO initiative and the podcast. I can't believe this is the first time I'm with you because I feel like you're a voice in my head. So I appreciate you. <laughs> Sorry <very> about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to say nice things about uh, both of you and Cisco and the work that you're doing. But Chuck, there's some breaking news about an award that you won recently, and I would like very much if you could share it because it reflects what you do every day. Please. You were supposed to do that. <laughs> I don't ever stick to the script. I'm a journalist. I'm not very good at that. Uh, University of North Carolina recognizes four or five distinguished alumni every year for contributions to humanity, and I received the recognition yesterday, so it was nice. <laughs> So well deserved, so well deserved. And I think that reflects the extraordinary achievement of Cisco that you're baking in that, in, into the way that you work and the way you design and the way that you listen. And I wanna acknowledge the extraordinary achievement of being on the list, the core list, every year for 25 years. And I know we've talked about this before. Sometimes it's at the end, sometimes it's closer to the top. But the things that have happened in the world are extraordinary, from war to recession, now pandemic, currency risks, natural disasters. You have managed to, to pull together the constancy and the values through different leadership and craziness in the world. And I just acknowledge and admire you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Where are my Cisco people? You here? <laughs> They're here. <laughs> Front and center. There may be some Cisco people in the audience. <laughs> So I'm going through the list here as the, the briefing document for this short conversation of all the things that you've accomplished in the people space when just the last two years was five pages long. And I really mean like just the headlines and the blurbs. So you have really, really been busy. And I'm talking equity and mental health and training, career growth, mentorship, and reaching into the world, advocating for the kinds of things that are gonna heal all of us, communities and all stakeholders. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, before we get into some of those headlines, I wanna ask a question that I've asked each of you separately but never together. And it's about your relationship. Because so much of what happens, and I think you probably know Cisco people, is that the relationships at the top of the company all the way through create an environment where people can invent, be courageous, and thrive. So can you tell us, um, how, what have you learned about working together? And how did that help you prepare for when the latest round of, of crises hit? Who would like to start? Well, you know, Fran was responsible for orchestrating the whole uh, activity when I competed to be the CEO. And so when I was chosen, I had a special place in my heart for her from that day forward. <laughs> uh, but I think it's, um, look, it, it's, it's incredible trust. Uh, it's, you know, with Fran, we don't, we don't always agree uh, or I have an idea and she says, can I think on that for a little while and come back to you? Which means I completely disagree, but I'm gonna bring you a better alternative. <laughs> but she does it so graciously and just smiles at me. Uh, but look, we've, um, there are times where she trusts my instincts and there are times where I trust her instincts and sometimes we've, we've made mistakes along the way. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think most of the time we've gotten to generally the right area but I just think it is trust, respect, and I mean, our employees love her. I mean, so 90% of the time, I just do what Fran says and everything is great. <laughs> Fran, how would you characterize things? Trust is the first word I would say as well. I have this memory, you probably don't even remember. Um, I was new in role and we were making some changes to our benefits and we were gonna announce them at a company meeting and we were both missing each other and Chuck was traveling and I just wanted to make sure before I announced them that he was comfortable with the changes. And so things kept happening, issues kept coming up and we never could talk about these, these benefit changes. And so as I'm about to go on stage okay. at the company meeting, this was back when we did that, I, uh, I said, hey Chuck, I never had a chance to run these changes by you. He's like, I trust you, I love them. And when you have that type of support, I think it makes you bolder. And it, you, I feel comfortable taking risk because I know if I make a mistake, which I do a lot, mm -hmm. um, Chuck's gonna understand the intent of that and, and be yeah. there, which I love and I'm very thankful for. 
He knows, you know each other's hearts, which is a big part of how you want to think about scaling um, opportunity at, the, at, at Cisco. So Chuck, while it's, I, just to set the stage real quick, uh, while it's clear you've always had a powerful leadership point of view, I wonder if it's fair to say that the letter that you, um, the all hands email that you sent after the death by suicide of Anthony Bourdain, followed quickly by Kate Spade, to the organization was a turning point or it was, a mo was an interesting moment to begin to do more transformational work. You know, I'd say, I, have, I haven't really looked back and thought about it that way, but it's probably accurate. Um, you know, for, for those of you who don't know, the, the week that Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade both committed suicide, this is where my instincts just kind of mm -hmm. kind of tingled, and I walked in Fran's office and I said, what if we have employees who are struggling, and this was before the pandemic, before people were talking about mental health. I said, what if we have employees that are struggling, and for some, like, they see these two events this week and they decide perhaps that's the path they should pursue right and i just said we got to do something and so we just wrote a simple email and outlined the uh you know hey we're, we're here for you people struggle we all know someone who struggled here are all the resources we have please take advantage of these talk to somebody get help blah blah blah, blah. thought it was just going to be an email that we sent out and i'd feel better and we'd move on and uh we just got inundated. Yeah. Uh, it was overwhelming. The, yeah. and, and then the number of people who wanted to tell their story or the story of their child or someone to, to on video in an in a all-hands company meeting to make sure that others could learn from their experience. And, uh, and then I think, it, it, I think the thing that was a turning point is it really just highlighted the need for leaders to just be humans mm -hmm. and not business people. Mm -hmm. And that was, it was a bit of an inflection point for us. And I think we handled, we, we handled everything from a human perspective as opposed to a business perspective from that point forward. So, Fran, I want to point to another moment in time. I know you know where I'm going with this. Yeah. Because what I'm, what I'm hearing is, is trust and vulnerability, a vulnerable uh, CEO, a caring CEO. That, that email let you know your thought process. Here that I, here's how I'm thinking about you as a community. Um, and then George Floyd was murdered. So from that backdrop, we're talking about mental health, we're talking to each other, we've, we're cracking the code on tender conversations, George Floyd is murdered. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the rapid listening work that you did and what you built from there? Yeah, I would say that um, we thankfully had been on a bit of a journey to really understand the experience of our black and African American employees. And earlier in 2020, Chuck had hosted about 18 African-American leaders at his home. Um, and we listened for about two and a half hours and we heard what it was like to be an African-American black employee at Cisco. And some of the stories were really wonderful and some of them were really painful and there wasn't a dry eye at the end of the period. And so what we did at that point was we committed to a set of actions a sprint, if you will, which is how we address some of the bigger business issues we have. And so that also signaled the importance. So we had just finished the sprint. We had worked on a lot of key issues. And then we go through this tragedy. And the reason that I share that is because I think there was a foundation of trust that had been established. Yeah. And I think you need to have that. I also think that if you go into these meetings, um, thinking that you have all the answers, you'll never have the meetings. And so we moved very quickly to have a meeting. We had Brian Stevenson uh, with us and we had Darren Walker with us. And uh, we addressed the pain um, in the system. We took questions, we talked about the work that we were doing, the realization that we wanted to play a bigger role in society in this regard. And I think similar to your previous question, these are moments that are real. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they signal who you want to be as a company as well. So digging in, we don't have, we could talk all day, I know, we, and sometimes we have. But digging into this document, I'm, I'm looking at the output of, of these moments and these moments of deep reflection and deep listening and the establishments of layers and layers of trust. So I want to ask you about um, the equity work that you're doing inside and outside of the company. Can you tell us, give us a highlight of that? 
Yeah, so we, coming out of this tragedy, formed our social justice actions. There are 12 of them. We also form these beliefs that just guide us. I feel like they are with us as we're thinking through decisions. The 12 actions are not only internally focused, but externally, looking at our supply chain, looking at our partners, looking at our representation, looking at our board. Um, and they're meaningful. When we look at the, the value of the 12 actions, it is close to $300 million. Um, and that's something that we're doing over the five years. And typically, we wouldn't share the dollar amount, but I think it's so important to say this is a big priority for us. The entire company is working on a lot of these actions. We hold ourselves accountable. As you know, we look at them quarterly. Yeah. And we're making progress and learning a lot. Well done, well done. Here's something that caught my eye in the data. 94% of Cisco employees say they have the flexibility to balance home and, wor and work. That is what, we, what Great Place to Work knows from the data, that you're not going to have happy people, happy workplace if you don't feel like you have that autonomy. Chuck, how do you think about the future of work? How, how, are you, how do you gauge the work that you've always already done to make sure that people have this and thinking about this going forward? Well, even before the pandemic, we, we were very open with our employees that if your child has a soccer game at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you should go, right? Because I know after dinner, you're probably going to be back on your laptop working when they go to bed. I mean, that's just sort of, because I knew that's how I had worked, you know? And, and so we had, already, we had already been thinking, like, we, we had a lot more flexible working model before the pandemic, I think, than most did. Yeah. And, um, and I just think that's, that's the core, I mean, parent, if you're happy at home, you're better at work, right? And if you're working and you're missing your kids' games, then if I have a manager who tells me I can't go to my soccer game because I have to be in a meeting, my kid's soccer game, I'm not going to like that person and I'm not going to like the company. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's the first piece. And then I think the future work is, I think it is around flexibility though. And, and we have to move to a focus on the output of our employees and not when do they work, where do they work. Mm -hmm. It's about the output. Yeah. Now, I am a little worried. Fran and I have started talking about this emerging concern that I have as we've given the teams, and Fran can talk about it, but we give the first line manager and their team the decision about how frequently to be in the office together. Mm -hmm. We let them decide based on how the value they believe exists from collaborating in person. But I'm I'm beginning to really worry about our early and career employees. So we're trying to figure out how do we balance and create events and opportunities for them to network and get to know people because I, I'm, I'm worried that it, their careers may not be as, as fruitful as they could be yeah. without some of that stuff that, that we all you know, benefited from. So we're, we're beginning that work right now. It must be so tough if you were first hired into your first job during the pandemic and the only image you have of a working office or like episodes of The Office or something like that. Like you only see it on TV. So I, it's impossible to be happy at work. It's impossible to bring the innovation and the joy that you need to if you don't feel that you yourself have a future. How have you tackled the, particularly through the equity lens, um, making sure that people have a career path? So um, this is something that we've studied a bit at Cisco. Yeah. Um, we studied about three or four years ago the paths of about 70,000 employees. And what we looked at was employees that moved quickly um, from one grade to the next. We looked at employees that stayed perhaps in one grade. We looked at different ways of working. And the woman that actually ran this research, Roxanne, is in the audience right now. Thank you, hey, Roxanne. Roxanne. And what she did was she found that there were about five different types of careers. And guess what? In every type of career, there was an equal amount of engagement and happiness. And so what I translate that to is it tells us that careers are personal. And the more that leaders are able to talk to their people about the type of career that they want to have, and the more that we, from a Cisco perspective, can create the different types of paths and opportunities, mm -hmm. that's gonna be meaningful. But I think the first thing is we have to start by asking our people what they want. And we have some really unique things that we've done around you know, stretch assignments or job swaps that I think are great ways to build those career paths. But um, I think this is an area where we have a lot of work to do as well. I'm looking forward to that. 
We touched on mental health, and I, there's another stat I want to acknowledge. 97% of Cisco employees say people care about each other. Um, four points higher than the top five among the 100 best, and it's consistent no matter who, we, who they are. Whatever identity they show up in, they feel that people care about each other. I think there's something really important there. Um, and you talked about it earlier. Um, I think part of the, your willingness to be a vulnerable leader, which seems to come somewhat naturally to you, but probably not to everybody. Um, <laughs> what advice do you have for either leaders or leaders who are influential within systems to create an organization, or at least set the stage for an organization where people feel cared about? <laughs> yeah, sometimes I'm probably a little more open than I should be. My wife says, you don't have to tell everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I'm naturally sort of an open, open book. Uh, and uh, I think that, um, look, I, I used to have this joke that my, when my dad got, got up in the morning, he would put on a suit and tie and he would become work dad. And then he would mm. come home and he would change clothes and he'd become dad dad again. And I don't think, we don't do that anymore. We're just sort of the same person all the time. And so my family sees the same person, although my, my wife says you get into CEO mode. Um, but generally, they see the same person that, at work. And There's a story there. I can tell by the way you're grinning. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's a lot of stories there. Um, I just tell her she gets in teacher mode, too, because she was a teacher when we met. But, um, and um, I think that, you know, for leaders, your employees want to know the human side of you. Yeah. They want to know. And that's one of the things that the pandemic did. Our employees said we're physically more, farther apart, but we feel closer together. I mean, early in the pandemic, I'm sitting on a video of WebEx with everybody in the company, and my granddaughter opens the door to my office, right? And I, and I just thought for a moment, I said, this will be a good lesson. I said, come here. And it was early, and I just wanted people to realize everybody's got kids at home. And I just popped her in my lap, and we just sat there for a few minutes. And uh, so I think just being willing to, to just, if, if you're vulnerable and you're open, then everyone in your organization will feel comfortable being that way in general. Not everybody ever will, but in general, people at least have, feel like they have the, the, the right and the environment where they can be. And to do it their way. Yep. Yeah. So I want to, we've talked a lot of, uh, we've talked about, we've touched on a lot of things, but to me, the common theme here is purpose. And I think it's something that we talk about a lot and we put it on our walls, but I'm not sure we all get it right. And I know that you're leading an, um, a, a relatively new organization within Cisco called People, Policy, and Purpose. Can you tell us about that work and why it matters? Yeah, absolutely. You know, something that Chuck and I have talked about over the years is the fact that when you run a good business, it also allows you to do good in the world. And we shouldn't look at these things as separate. Um, and so this new organization looks at how we operationalize purpose across everything we do. And the organization is made up of teams like our real estate team, sustainability, our country digitization team, our people organization, which is now led by Kelly Jones, who I think I see in hey the front Kelly. row. So thrilled that Kelly is in this role. And basically we have the ability to intersect these really important topics and think about how we show up to our customers, how we help them, for an example, on their journey to net zero, how we drive social justice in our ecosystem. And so our purpose, as you know, as a company is to power an inclusive future for all. And I feel so lucky that I lead a team that figures out how we do this across the company. Aww. And you should, have, you should have seen Fran. She presented in the round in front of 20,000 people at our sales meeting and talked about why our purpose matters to their engagements with their customers and why it will ultimately be good for your business to understand it, be able to articulate it and what we're doing. And it was unbelievably well received. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. As you know, as many of you now know, my purpose is to mine the world and the world of business for the kinds of ideas and people and impulses that will make the world more equitable and just. I couldn't do it without you. You have been so generous to me, and everyone at Cisco has been so generous to me, so thank you. Thank you to every one of you for being here and the work that you all do in the world. We're going to have a round of applause, and then I'm going to say one more thing. So we started this session with some breaking news, Chuck, um, and we're going to end with some breaking news as well. Is Michael behind me yet? Because I feel like he's always like about to lurk out. We're gonna, I'm going to invite Michael C. Bush 
son of Booker T. Out There's here. Michael Bush. Hey, everybody. For some breaking news. Hey. So, can I get the next slide? It's not hey, this is a slide of some social media for a truly remarkable person. We are giving one award this year to a truly remarkable person. So, this is the Fran Katsuda slide. And one of the greatest people leaders in the world, everybody knows that, okay, that's well documented. But looking at what you've been doing in this crazy world, physically moving yourself around the world to do these things too, tweeting what you tweet and getting the heat and continuing to tweet, that's why you're getting this award. Thank you. Um, next slide. So this happens to be a quote from, from one of your people. I'm not going to read the whole quote because uh, it's a whole lot. It says a whole bunch of great things. Here's the part I like. Remote work was literally life-changing for me, and I was unable to do this long before the pandemic. The company has not only vocalized support for gender-based pay equity, it has acted on it. Then I go to the bottom. Lastly, I happen to work on a team that is small but almost exclusively women, individual contributors throughout our SVP. In my adult working life, I've never had this happen. This was an organic occurrence that says more to me about equity progress than any HR campaign or executive statement. Today, we give our, great, our first Great Place to Work Equity for All Award to Francine Katsudis. Yeah, can we get a photo? Not an iPhone photo, a real photo. Yeah, there we go. Serious photo person. Come on, Chuck. Please. <laughs> Everything's better when Chuck's here. For sure. Well, most things. <laughs> <laughs> Many things. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you Thank so you. much. Okay. It means a lot. All right. It's heavy. I'll take Carry it. Carry <laughs> it carefully. <laughs> All right. It is heavy. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Round of applause for the Cisco team.